Welcome everyone to uh, the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute Safe Autonomy Workshop. Uh, this is day two, and we have another uh, you know terrific uh, days of uh, speakers. Uh, yesterday, so so this uh, workshop is about um, the challenges and methodologies for realizing sort of the autonomy vision. And yesterday we had a had a great uh, day. Um, uh, uh, full of, of terrific talks and very uh, strong uh, panel discussion at the end. Things that we talked about, about were uh, certifying specifications, risk sets, landing ellipsoids and, and the like, uh, dealing with um, algorithmic, complex algorithmic components like neural nets, how do we do that? Uh, human machine interaction. We also talked about policies and technology's role in, in uh, shaping that, which we may talk about on the panel again today. Here's today's schedule. So again, it's arranged in uh, three uh, mini sessions of two 30 minute talks each, uh, followed by a panel session, which all the speakers will participate in. Uh, one uh, programming change, um, the, the 11.30 to 12 talk will now be given by uh, Catherine Driggs Campbell from the University of Illinois. So uh, with that, um, uh, no. let me uh, turn it over to Claire uh, no. for the first talk. Thanks very much, Gare. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, start the day off with uh, our first speaker, Peter Abiel. So, um, and a pleasure to introduce Peter. So Peter's a professor in ECS at UC Berkeley. He's also a founder of a company called Covariant.ai, um, which specializes in uh, designing AI robotics for the real world, um, focusing in particular on industrial automation. Um, I would say that Peter, um, you know, when he moved to Berkeley uh, after he finished his PhD at Stanford, he really kind of transformed the, um, the, the robotics group at Berkeley because he brought the, the kind of um, expertise and the implementations of machine learning and really started to integrate it into the robotics program in a way that had never been done before. And in that way, I'd say he's a, He's a, um, you know, a pioneer, not only at Berkeley, but also in the field of bringing machine learning into robotic systems. Um, his lab works on deep reinforcement learning, imitation learning, unsupervised learning, transfer learning. And today he's going to talk about responsive safety in uh, reinforcement learning for robotics. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire, for the very kind intro, and I'm so glad to have, have you at Berkeley and, and your students always in my classes and so forth. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. So, um, diving right in here, I'm going to cover two things in this session. One is about responsive safety. The other one is about stabilizing learning. So let's start with the responsive safety. So when you think about learning for control, let's say reinforcement learning, you tend to have an objective that you're optimizing. And, but you might also have constraints that you want to satisfy, um, possibly during learning. And so then the question is, how do you bring in those constraints? And if you, know, if you work in optimization quite a bit, of course, you'll say, hey, if I can optimize an objective, I can just augment my objective with Lagrangian terms, and there I have a constraint optimization problem that's being solved by just solving a regular optimization problem. I just need to adjust the Lagrange multiplier as I go along to make sure it solves the right problem that actually satisfies the constraints. And that's exactly what people have been doing. But if you look at what happens when you do this, if you do this in a traditional Lagrangian way, on the left panel here, what you see is vertical axis in red is the constraint. And in this case, we want the constraint to stay below 200. It's an expected value of g of x. And we see that sometimes it exceeds and it goes back down because the Lagrange multiplier gets cranked up and then it gets too low. We don't need it to be that low. And we see in blue that the objective also dips. And so we're not doing as well as we could because we're you know, satisfying a constraint with more margin than we need to. Then the Lagrange multiplier adjusts and now our objective goes up, but also we start violating the constraint. And often there's this pretty large oscillation happening when you use this kind of method. And if you know come from traditional control, you might say, well, this reminds me of when I do just P control or purely integral control, and I should introduce a damping term. And if I introduce a damping term, this should work a lot better 
And you know, this, this of course sounds pretty obvious as we talk about it now, but somehow we could not find any past literature on actually doing this in Lagrangian-based constraint optimization to explicitly introduce these damping terms. And so that's what we did specifically in the context of reinforcement learning. And what you see here now in red again is the constraint value of G of X and we want it to be below 200. And we see indeed, if it goes over, it gets brought back down, but we don't get that oscillation because we introduce damping terms in how we run this. This is not specific to reinforcement learning, by the way, you can apply this in other um, constraint optimization problems, but our research was in the context of reinforcement learning. And we see that it actually improves the objective gradually and also reduces oscillation there. Diving a little bit deeper into what is set up as in equations, we have a constraint optimization problem. We minimize overall choice of x, uh, f of x, as long as g of x equals zero, which is our constraint. Our previous slide was g of x had to be equal to 200, but same thing. And then we turn it into a Lagrangian objective, f of x plus lambda times g of x, where of course we need the right choice of lambda to make this work. And that's why we're optimizing both x and lambda at the same time. The traditional way to do this is your updates for x would be just derivative of the Lagrangian and take a step in the negative gradient direction because we're minimizing respect to x. And then for lambda, we'd be maximizing. And so we'd take a step in the direction of g of x. But if you then look at the dynamics, you see it's um, it becomes oscillator dynamics, but insufficient damping. And so we can change this by adding an explicit damping term, g dot of x, and we get improved damping. Now, if you look at this, this is just a simple scalar version. And I could imagine many people on this call um, might you know, be able to drive the non-scalar versions in the future um, that you know, ma matrix, uh, in a, linear matrix inequalities might be useful to get a, a matrix version of this that can handle more than one constraint. The experiment we looked at was in OpenAI Safety Gym, which is an environment that's kind of dedicated to have some constraints. And so here we have an, an RL evaluation in the learning curves. On the top here is the actual cost that we want to keep below a certain amount, below 200, below 150, below 100, or below 50 for the different learning curves. And then in the bottom plot, we have the returns achieved. In yellow is the traditional method with no proportional term. In uh, green is the new method, which introduces a proportional term, which provides a damping because the default is actually just integral, uh, which is not so stable. And what we see here is that indeed in green, we get much more stable uh, conversions onto essentially the constraint boundary rather than oscillating around it, which we see with the traditional uh, Lagrangian method. So that's one idea I wanted to share. The other idea I wanted to share is how to deal with instabilities in Q learning without kind of killing the signal all along with it. Because it's easy to avoid instability by, by doing nothing. It's like doing self-driving by staying at home. Um, you'll have no accidents, but you, know, you really want to still achieve something. So in Q learning, if you have run Q learning, the core of it is that you have a Q function that you're trying to learn. You want to know what is the expected in controls cost to go in reinforcement learning, expected uh, sum of rewards from a certain state ST, taking action AT and acting hopefully optimally from then onwards. And you bootstrap it by saying it's the immediate reward RT or immediate cost at that time, plus a discount factor times the optimal cost to go or rewards from there, uh, which are encoded in the Q function. And so what this assumes really is that this QST plus one A is somehow informative about your QSTAT. So you're bootstrapping from something about the future, but you're actually using that same Q function. And so if your Q function is not perfect yet because you're trying to learn it, you're kind of trying to learn from something that has noise in it and the error can easily propagate. So, what, by the way, what people have done in the past is kind of attenuate that by introducing uh, ways to, you know, multiple Q functions and not taking, taking the argmax in one and then the max from the other and so forth, but that loses signal. So what we're looking at here is, can we maybe reweight these um, updates? Because they come, the way we do this, we set up an objective, which is a squared error objective. Uh, for the Q value where we have R plus gamma Q hat is the target and we want Q to get close to that. 
how about we reweight it based on the confidence? If our Q hat is uh, something we're confident about, we can have a high weighting. And if Q hat is something we're not confident about, then we should have a lower weighting in the objective. And that way we propagate largely signal and less so noise. But how do we quantify the uncertainty on this target value? Well, there's something that actually works quite well, which is to train an ensemble of Q functions. And this is a general idea that is used in just supervised learning just as well. If you train multiple neural networks independently on the same data, they will make different decisions on holdout data because they were initialized differently. And so when they differ by a large discrepancy, it means probably your data was not very informative for the prediction you're trying to make. If they largely agree, then it means that the data on which you trained was probably quite informative about the new prediction you're trying to make. This is called the bootstrap in statistics and traditionally is done by actually subsampling the data. Let's say take 80% of the data for one thing you train, another 80% for another thing you train, and then compare uh, the predictions. But for large neural networks, you don't need to subsample. Just different initialization uh, tends to be enough to get different predictions and get the same effect. And that way you don't need to throw out any data for training any of your networks. So the way we did this, we investigated a few different schemes. You apply a sigmoid to the standard deviation of the Q values that we have for that target Q value. And then some temperature value there that is a tweaking parameter that we, you know, we have to play around with as a hyperparameter to get this to work as well as possible. But we kept that the same across the experiments. And so what it means, it, it means that the weight goes to one for something you're very confident about when you're bootstrapping from it and goes to 0 0.5 in this case when you're not confident. So we never throw data out. We assume there is, in this case, effectively, there is always some signal that we're trying to bring in. So the way that Bell and Backup Loss, as a reminder, looks like this. And what we see in the box at the top is the weighting function. The way we compute the standard deviation is by, of course, we. We have a set of Q networks and we can look at uh, the variance of that. What's important to realize is that to make this variance informative, when we do the backups, we cannot use the mean of the Q values. So for each Q function that you learn, you need to learn them as independently as possible. Otherwise you don't have independent members of the ensemble. So the, each Q function is trained with its own target Q function, but the weighting is where they interact. And that's the only place they interact. The weighting determines, well, is determined by the variance across the Q functions in the ensemble. Otherwise completely independently trained. So once you have an ensemble, which admittedly is a bit of extra effort and that's, that's some room for improvement here. If you can achieve the same idea without having to construct ensembles, it could, could save you some compute and, and storage. Um, but once you have an ensemble, you can also start using that when you choose actions to explicitly explore. Because as you're learning, you want to take actions that lead you to things you don't know much about yet. And so if you look at the actions today, you say, well, which action maximizes mean plus standard deviation of my Q function estimate? Because then I might go see things that um, optimistically could be good. They could be bad, but optimistically they could be good. And so it's a good idea to go explore and see what happens. One thing we also noticed is that, and where this ensemble becomes extra important is that once you introduce this notion of explicit exploration based on the standard deviation, um, your Q learning becomes more off policy. If you, if you run Q learning, it's, meant, it's an off policy method. You can use it with any kind of data. But in practice, when you run Q learning, you typically run it Epsilon Greedy or Boltzmann uh, Softmax, which means that you're largely on policy which means that in practice, when you run Q learning in most incarnations, you get natural feedback from the data that you collect. And so there's a natural stabilization in Q learning. Once you start explicitly exploring like we do here, where you look at the standard deviation to choose your actions, you're actually explicitly going off policy against what your Q function might recommend. And that actually tends to destabilize it. And what you'll see is that the fact that we use an ensemble to stabilize with the weighted loss function becomes much more important once we do this um, UCB exploration. So what do we have in the complete picture here? We have UCB exploration during Q-learning. 
based on the mean and standard deviation of the Q function at the current state. And so we take the optimistic action, which drives it quite off policy from what the mean would predict in many, many cases, which in turn tends to require this. I mean, stabilization is always good, but it makes it even more important to stabilize the Q learning itself by doing weighted learning, where again, it's important to keep all Q functions separate in terms of how they're trained. The only coupling is of course in the data collected and then in the weighting, uh, which is based on the standard deviation of the target value. So we evaluated this on three standard environments, OpenAI Gym, which is often used for learning from state uh, and continuous actions, DeepMind Control Suite, which is often used for learning with visual inputs and continuous actions, and then Atari, which is often used for learning from visual inputs and discrete actions. So let's look at learning from state first. Uh, the method that I described we call Sunrise and the reinforcement learning algorithm used in this case uh, is soft actor critic, which is probably the most popular um, on, well, not entirely on policy. It's an actor critic method. It's, it's close to on policy, but not entirely on policy method. Um, and most often used for continuous control tasks these days. And we, and we see here that soft actor critic already has some of the stronger performance, adding the UCB um, exploration and the stabilization consistently improves performance over soft actor critic and almost consistently has the best performance. Poplin is a model-based RL method. Um, METRPO is another model-based RL method. PETS is also model-based and then TD3 is very similar to soft actor critic is probably the best way to summarize it. Um, so consistently um, improving a soft data critic and three out of four outperforming the others and often by a pretty large margin. Then something we did, so on the previous slide, this was for um, 200,000 time steps, which is pretty short training. It's nice for experimental turnaround, but some environments like humanoid require longer training. So here we have um, 800,000 time steps. And so what we see here is that we get an effect that keeps growing actually over time where regular SAC hasn't really learned to solve humanoid yet at the 800,000 time steps, but Sunrise, thanks to its better exploration and stabilization, is actually doing uh, very well after 800,000 time steps. Then we looked at uh, learning from pixel inputs. So in DeepMind Control Suite, uh, again, a range of tasks is 100K and 500K steps. And here we build on top of RAD. So RAD and Dr. Q and CURL are three recent methods that are uh, very good at combining self-supervised losses um, or data augmentation with reinforcement learning. And it was shown in the past uh, year that thanks to having data augmentation and or self-supervised losses, it is possible to learn from pixel input almost as effectively as from direct access to state in these um, DeepMind Control Suite benchmarks. So we built on top of RAD, which is one of the three that are uh, state of the art on this, added the ideas I described, the UCB exploration and the stabilization by weighted Bellman uh, losses. And we see that we get consistent improvement and more or less consistently the best performance on all of these environments. Then we also looked at the Atari games where the story is still a bit more balanced. Uh, the model-based method simple still does best about half the time. Um, but again, Sunrise, which here builds on Rainbow, which is uh, the most commonly used model-free queuing method for uh, Atari. Sunrise builds directly on that by adding the UCB exploration and the way that Bellman uh, losses consistently improves or almost consistently improves on Rainbow and achieves state-of-the-art in about half of the environments. Okay, so one thing you might ask is specifically, does the weighted Bellman backup reduce error propagation? So there's been a paper actually by uh, our Berkeley colleague, Sergey Levin, student uh, Avral Kumar called Discord, which specifically looked at what if we introduce noise in the reward function? So explicitly are going to introduce noise in our reinforcement learning setup well, that noise might propagate and might make learning harder. And the Discord method specifically tries to address this. And so we also compared Sunrise with Discord on the environments from the Discord paper 
and we see that um, Sunrise, just like Discord, is able to uh, you know, learn consistently, even though there is explicit noise uh, introduced in the learning process here. Uh, Discord does it by looking at cumulative Bellman errors and also does a weighted Bellman backup by looks at cumulative Bellman errors and based on that decides to weight the, the backups um, rather than using an ensemble uh, to understand in some sense the, the intrinsic uncertainty we, we have about uh, the target values. So um, ready to wrap up here. The main takeaways for the Sunrise part are that an ensemble can be used to prevent error propagation in Q-learning. Um, behind there, there's an additional benefit that once you have an ensemble, you can do explicit exploration, which is beneficial in off-policy methods like soft actor critic and uh, Q-learning. Um, in parallel, we've actually done experiments that did not report on here uh, for on-policy learning, uh, like uh, proximal policy optimization. There we found that it's already so stable in some sense that it doesn't really help uh, to have this additional stabilization. So the big benefit comes in the off-policy learning, which by default is a bit less stable and becomes even less stable once you make it more off-policy due to explicit exploration. There's a preprint that's online for this and the code is all available. And I'm gonna leave the remainder of time for a uh, discussion or, you know, making sure we stay on time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, we have a, a couple of minutes now for some questions. And as Gare said, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. You can ask questions in the chat, um, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, and because I have a burning question, I'm actually gonna start um, with, the, the, with one question kind of to launch us off. So, so Peter, can you, and maybe this is a little bit of a broader question, but can you comment on um, the, uh, how, like for, for example, for this ensemble method that you presented, how do you, um, how do you typically view this and other methods which need to do, um, th there's some um, exploration and um, kind of testing out an interaction with the environment that needs to be done initially, right? In, in using learning methods like this, and in particular using an ensemble method like this. In, in a, in a, like a, a real robot scenario, um, like the kind that you've worked in and in both Berkeley and Covariant and other places, how do you, how do you kind of reconcile, like where, where is this, where and when is this exploration done? Do you do a lot ahead of time in simulation? And then do you transfer that to the actual platform? Do you do a lot of kind of testing of the platform in the lab before releasing it? Do you have kind of testing after you release it. What's the, what's the framework there? If you could talk from your experience, both in academia and industry to this, I think it would be really um, informative. Oh, ab absolutely. So th there, there's a lot of aspects. One is when, when we're doing algorithmic development, naturally, so almost all the early development happens in simulation because a lot of ideas can be tested in simulation first, um, with, even though you have the real world in mind. From there, once there's signs of life, to get actually something working in the real world, um, collecting real world data is very time consuming and often costly. So almost invariably, we would first train in, in simulation, try to match the simulator pretty closely to real world. And so in practice, of course, matching it perfectly is, is not, not really possible. And so, the most popular thing for us to do is to first put a good effort in trying to match it up. Then from there, um, use domain randomization, which will introduce randomness in the simulator in a way that is, it's not that necessarily we expect there to be a ton of noise in the real world, but we just expect mismatches between simulator and real world. And so this is effectively the, let's say the Monte Carlo counterpart of robust control. So instead of our algorithm explicitly integrating and in how it's being set up over possible uncertainties and unknowns, you just do Monte Carlo rollouts with different incarnations of what the world might be like. And you try to learn something that's either um, capable of dealing with all of it or that is explicitly trained to be adaptive 
to explicitly learn learning something that is quick to adapt to the real world that it might encounter later. Now, when we go from kind of research world to covariant world, I would say the big difference is kind of the very long tail of real world scenarios where there's always new things you encounter. And I think for most of us, that's most familiar from self-driving. Right? We, we know that you know, a lot of self, if you think about self-driving, you know, 99% of the time, a car can drive quite reliably on its own. It's not a problem to get to 99%, but you know, 99% is just deadly if that's all you have. So you don't want a 99% car and, and you know, taking an autonomous ride in that. And I think that that's the big challenge is covering not just, I mean, I'm sure current self-driving is better than 99%, but still, even if it's 99.9, .9, getting to the last bits of reliability is super hard because there's all these things that you haven't seen before and they don't occur frequently and you kind of need to go collect data. And so in, in my mind, in some sense, almost all the learning can actually happen in simulation if you want to, except that you need to somehow inspire that simulator all the time by data you collect in the real world. So you can collect data in the real world. You have something that you didn't anticipate, whether it's for robotic manipulation in a warehouse or a factory, or whether it's for self-driving, you bring that data back, but that's just one data point. They need to do massive data augmentation on that one data point to train your system to improve. And so that's the loop I see is get real world data, not because of the amount of data you need from there, but all the corner cases you need to see, and then do massive augmentation on that data in simulation to keep training. Yeah. No, but thank you for that really thoughtful answer. I think that's um, a lot of trying to understand how to deploy such systems and how to collect data so that we can feel more confident that um, what we're deploying is something that's going to behave well in the real world is, is really critical right now. Um, any uh, questions? So we have a couple minutes, one or two minutes left, if there are additional questions. A quick question, Claire, can I go ahead? Yeah, Srikanth. Yeah, so uh, I guess in the second part of your talk, I, if I understood it correctly, you were uh, correcting for the bias that's introduced by not knowing the Q value on the right-hand side of the uh, Q learning equation. So there are other algorithms that have been suggested too for this, like double Q learning and various things. I was just curious how what you're suggesting compares with those and, and what are the benefits, additional benefits? Thanks. Yeah, so double Q learning, what it will do, it'll say, it'll keep two Q functions. So it's, it's a bit like having a small ensemble, but then what it does with those two Q functions is it doesn't try to maximize the signal extracted. It tries to maximize stabilization. So it'll say, um, I need to get the max. So I'm going to use one Q function to see which action maximizes on that Q function. I'm going to use that action with the other Q function. And so that avoids overfitting to the first one. When, when you do a max, you might be overfitting and choosing an action that's overfitting to noise in that Q function. I'll call it noise rather than bias, but I mean, it's, it's, it's related. And so that stabilizes it, but it loses a lot of signal along the way. And so that's the way I would differentiate it. it you can look at it as a improved version of double Q learning where rather than just stabilizing, you're still trying to keep maximal signal around as you do the stabilization. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Um, any other questions? Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, Peter, when you initialize the, the algorithm by choosing sort of different initial conditions, do you just do that uniformly or do you have a way to do that as well? Yeah, so it, it, it's something I've been actually proposing to my students to, to work on and investigate more theoretically what exactly it needs to be done there. Because um, it's widely used to, to have an ensemble by just having random initialization, the standard random initialization scheme. And that seems to be enough. Whereas statistically, if you look at the literature, the theory says that you need to subsample different subsets of your data randomly to get the bootstrap effect. Um, but so far, we, we haven't actually made any, any, any progress. And part of it might also be the inclination of my students is on average a bit more empirical than it is purely theoretical. And so I think if somebody had a more theoretically inclined group, I think there's an opportunity there to try to dig in and understand, you know, what is actually needed to ensure that, you know, th this current practice in neural net ensembles is actually giving us the correct answer. And maybe we are doing it right, maybe not. Um, it'd be interesting to, to it's investigate. It's working well, yeah. 
Thanks. Yeah, I think that that's a really a really cool idea. This kind of mixture of uh, empirical and uh, perhaps pushing on the analytical as well, if possible. Um, thank you, Peter.